Well, if you want to, if you can join me in welcoming Dr. David Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Um, Ella Wiesel famously said that what begins with the Jews never ends with the Jews. You know, what happens to humanity, he said, happens to the Jews first. Um, and it's, he's often quoted, but uh, seldom is it explained why that's the case. Why is it the case that what, it doesn't stop with the Jews? Aren't the Jews enough? Um, <clears throat> one clue to this why lies in another statement he made uh, about what he called the ultimate mystery of the Holocaust, which is that whatever happened took place in the soul. Um, but what does that mean exactly? Um, first, why the Jews? Is this another case of, of bigotry and a long history of bigotry? Is it a case of envy, economic envy? All those uh, Nobel Prize winners, all that wealth, uh, we hate them for it, scapegoating. You need someone to, to blame everything on. Xenophobia, at least in Germany, it can't be xenophobia because the Jews <laughs> looked very much like their German neighbors. They ate the same Wiener schnitzel, they, they were business partners, they, you know, so they're not weird looking Hasidic Jews in Germany. Racism, um, I don't think it's racism, and I'll explain. The Germans, the Nazis, were not anti-Semites because they were racist, they were racist because they were anti-Semites. So there's a scene that goes to this, goes deeper into this matter of why the Jews and, and why the human, human being, what the Jews have to do with humanity. Um, there's a scene in The Book Thief, if you've seen the film, where Liesel, the little girl in Nazi Germany, uh, sees her foster father shoved to the ground by the SS as they're picking up a Jew and hauling him away. She goes back to her home where Max is a young Jewish guy hiding in their basement, and she asks Max, why do they hate the Jews? Why do they hate my father? Why do they hate us? And Max answered, because we remind them of their, of their humanity. Now, why would you hate someone for reminding you of your humanity, and why would you kill them? What are we reminded of, exactly, when we're reminded of that? Um, we are reminded, among other things, of an infinite responsibility that, we, that is placed in our hands, entrusted to our care, for something infinitely dear. And because the dearness of uh, the holiness of the other human being is infinite, we can never do enough. In fact, the responsibility grows with each response. It's like in the last scene of Schindler's List. Uh, when they give Schindler the, the, you know, the ring, that's, he who saves a single life saves the world entire from the Talmud. Um, and suddenly he realizes the infinite scope of the responsibility. The, the, the debt increases in the measure that it's paid. The accounts are never settled. So it's not for nothing that the Jews are accused of controlling the ledgers of the world. Um, so the, the, the Holocaust entails an assault on something infinite and infinitely precious, something that eludes utterance. There, in the last 20 years, there have been about 40 books published on Holocaust representation. One of my books is called The Holocaust and the Non-Representable. The, 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 the literary response is about giving utterance to the ineffable, voicing what eludes utterance. Uh, artistic f portrayals, photographs, are about conveying something of the invisible, what doesn't meet the eye. Um, because, it's like, it's, it, it, because it is about an assault on the soul, about uh, an assault on the nameless and the nameless one. On August 24th, 1941, 
like a month after the killing units started moving to the east from June 22, 1941, killing every Jew they could find. They killed tens of thousands in the first month. Word got back to England, reports back to England. Churchill says, we are in the presence of a crime without a name. August 1941, this is way, this is way before uh, the gas chambers in Birkenau went into operation. Okay. Um, Paul Ceylon, a famous poet and survivor, simply referred to it as Das was geschah, that, that which happened. He had no name. He had no word. Um, and Omar Bartov, famous uh, Holocaust scholar, in his book Murder in Our Midst, comments that uh, the multiplicity of the names for the Holocaust is, as he says, is the ob ob obverse side of God's multiplicity of names. God has 72 names. Okay? Because God is the nameless one. Um, the Holocaust is the, na is the nameless event. And among other things, the Holocaust is an assault on the name. Names were eclipsed by numbers. You had to repeat your number in German in the camp to get whatever ration they might be doling out that day. Um, it's an assault on the name with the small n and the name with the, with the big n. And some of the, the problems of naming it, these are some common names for the event. The Holocaust, we know Holocaust uh, is, a, is, a, is a Greek word, comes from the Greek, is, is complete uh, burnt offering by fire, offering by fire, being burnt completely. Right? Uh, and fire is indeed a dominant image in the Holocaust. Those of you who have read Night, remember Madame Schechter on the train who sees fire. Jews, I see fire, I see fire. Shoah. Shoah, Hebrew word, means uh, annihilation, um, turned, made into nothingness. Annihilation, Shoah. Um, the, the Holocaust is the final solution to the Jewish problem. The hol Holocaust is not a, a synonym for everything bad that happened between 1933 and 1945 in Europe. Um, it's about the Jews. The Holocaust is about the Jews. Many others were murdered. There were, not all victims were, were Jews, but all Jews were victims. Okay. Uh, in German, it's stated quite clearly, it's referred to as the Judenvernichtung, which is the annihilation of the Jews. Um, there's another Hebrew word that you see in Yiddish, used in Yiddish. Yiddish has many Hebrew words, churban. Churban is an especially powerful word, a telling word, because churban is a word that is used to refer to the destruction of, of the two temples. Uh, the first temple in 586 BCE and the second temple in the year 70 of the Common Era. That's a churban. Some, I know some... Uh, who, uh, in the Jewish world, who referred to the Holocaust as the third Khurban. What is so devastating about Khurban? We taught that the temple was designed uh, with windows, so its windows would not let light in, but let light out. The, the destruction of the temple is the destruction of a divine light that emanates into the world. The divine presence, what confers meaning on everything. Devastating, right? Um, and this is, this is an image of, you know, artistic image of Khurban. Um, so what is it? There's this problem of naming the event. Uh, there's a famous uh, incident in this regard. Gideon Hausner was the prosecutor for the Eichmann trial. He uh, approached uh, a Holocaust survivor, very, very well known as a novelist named Yechiel Dinor. His, his pen name is Katsetnik 135633, which is, Katsetnik means camp inmate. Hausner asked Katsetnik, 
Dinor to testify, and Dinor begged him, don't call me, don't call me, don't call me. I don't know, I was in, I was in Auschwitz for two years. Long time in Auschwitz. I saw everything. I saw the beating, the starvation, the brutality, humiliation, the burning. The... But that's not Auschwitz. What it is, I can't say. So he gets on the stand. He tries to describe it in, in, in poetic terms as best he can. It was a, it, as a planet where people were not born. People did not die. People had no names. They didn't wear the clothes that you wear, that I wear. And once in a while, before he would make a statement, he would say, I'm, I'm I believe with complete faith, which is a refrain from uh, the liturgy. You know, the 13 principles of Maimonides, I, I believe with complete faith. He would insert the, this prayer into his testimony until finally he collapsed. He was paralyzed for six weeks afterward. You can see this, you can see this nine minutes on YouTube. Just look, Dinor Eichmann trial. He couldn't say what it is. He couldn't say what it is. Now, what is it exactly? Why, what's, what is the metaphysical dimension? What is it that eludes utterance? And how does it come to bear in anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews? How does it how does, where does the road to Auschwitz begin? And what is it made of? I think, you know, in the pre-Christian era, there were plenty of people who hated Jews. Uh, Democritus, the Greek philosopher, claimed that uh, in the fifth century before the Common Era, claimed that the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, uh, hunt down strangers on the road and kidnap them to slaughter them in their temple. Blood libel. Right? Tacitus, Roman historian, Manetho, Egyptian priests, they all had contempt for the Jews as a culture, a people, uh, strange people. With the advent of Christianity, the Jew goes into a theological category. As progressively from beginning with St. Ignatius of Antioch, who died in the year 108, uh, who forbade Christians to observe the commandments of the Torah. And this is before the, or while the Christians are still trying to figure out who they are. Not all the Gospels have been written yet, right? Um, then you, by, by degrees, you have the, the, the advent of supersessionism, you know, displacement theology. There's a new people, a new covenant, a new dispensation. Delegitimization of the Jews, demonization of the Jews. Um, so by the end of the fourth century, when Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire, you have, I mean, figures like St. John Chrysostom, St. Jerome, St. Augustine. Uh, Chrysostom saying uh, that the, the devil leads the Jews in their revelry in their synagogues. They're devil worshippers. So they be, the Jew becomes like a mythic figure. Um, St. Jerome says, uh, anyone who observes the ceremonies of the Jews, all of which Jesus observed, right, falls into the pit of the devil. Uh, St. Augustine says that the, you know, the other city has run its course, not in light, but in shadow. From the time of Abraham, the Jews, the, the covenant of Abraham was never in light, so, it's, so to say. It was always in darkness. It was always wrong-headed. Um, so as you demonize the Jews, they, they become not just an unpleasant ethnic group or someone you don't like to look at. It becomes a religious duty to hate Jews. Something holy and pleasing to God. Something necessary to redemption. So in the crusade, in the time of the crusades, you have priests telling their, their congregants that whoever kills a Jew has a, has a place in paradise. Now, 
to be fair, I have to be quick to point out that the higher up in the ecclesiastic hierarchy, they would say, no, 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 that's not how you get to heaven. It's only through Jesus. You can't kill a Jew. It's not that Jew's blood that gets you to heaven. It's another Jew's blood. Okay? But the fact that this would even be preached tells you why. Because the, with the demonization of the Jew, uh, what you, you go into a situation where it's not that all Jews are evil, but all evil is Jewish. And to vanquish evil from the world entails the elimination of the Jews. So you have images like this. Uh, this is from uh, the 15th century. Uh, you see the devil with the, the circle on his collar. The circle is the Jew badge. Uh, and above this, I mean, this, this appears on one, in one piece. You have an image of the blood libel, uh, according to which Jews kidnap Christian children and reenact the crucifixion, slaughter them, and use their blood in their rituals. Usually it's you know, pass, to make Passover matzah. So... Uh, the Jews prey on the soul. The soul is in the blood, as it's written. The Jews are, again, they're not just uh, dirty and smelly and wrong and deluded and dangerous. They threaten the very life of the soul. You can't attain purity, the purity that's necessary for salvation without purging your, 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 the body of Christ, the church, the body, or later the body politic, without purging the Jew from the body. And indeed, with the advent of the Spanish Inquisition, you have this phrase introduced, limpieza de sangre, purity of the blood. What does it mean? And you, I mean, you'll see how it figures with the Nazis, is, is the idea is that the Judaism is in the blood. You can't get it out. So this, this is the beginning of closing the door on the Jew that, that otherwise might have uh, been an exit, namely conversion. Um, and indeed, those of you who know this history know that the conversos were always suspect. Right. What is the purpose of the Inquisition? There were four major inquisitions, the medieval inquisition, Spanish inquisition, Portuguese inquisition, and the Roman inquisition, in that order. And in each case, the main purpose is to purge the, the body of believers of heresy, because heresy, false belief in the religion that is based on, based on correct belief, the creed, is necessary to salvation. False belief keeps you out of heaven. For the sake of Christendom, heresy has to be rooted out. And with the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions, the heresy was Judaizing. The Jews and Judaism threatened the life of the soul. Uh, things didn't get much better. I'm sorry, this is off. Uh, with the advent of, of the Protestant Reformation, uh, Luther wrote several uh, invectives against the Jew. One of the more famous ones is called On the Jews and Their Lies, you may have heard of. Uh, Luther recommended that Jews be put in labor camps, that they be forbidden from studying Torah on pain of death, uh, that uh, he claimed that they would, they would crucify 10 more messiahs and kill God himself if it were possible the deicide charge. They, they, the Jews threaten again God himself. Um, they have a godlike, an anti-godlike air about them. Now, what about with the advent of uh, an age in which that is characterized by thinking God out of the picture? Modernity the Enlightenment. 
Where's the Jew there? Um, often, Christ, the, the, the centuries of Christian anti-Semitism are pointed to to explain National Socialism, and it's, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, in my view. Also a necessary condition was a philosophical justification for the elimination of the Jew, philosophical, ideological. And like Protestantism, similar to Protestantism, it entails a turn inward, seems to me, with the, the sola fide, that by faith alone, you have this turn inward. It's my inner faith that opens the gate for me. Um, these are other ways of turning inward, with, and I could name many more, with Kant, Wagner, Nietzsche, Kant. Uh, Kant is known for his notion of uh, autonomy, which is a turn inward. Reality is reduced to the perceiving self. The autonomous individual is the only one who is free. Uh, and autonomy, Kant says, is, is determined by being self-legislating. Okay. Determining through your own reason, not through your whims, of course, but through reason, good and evil. The categorical imperative. Right? Act only in such a way that you can will that there should be a universal maxim from your action. Of course, the will comes into play. Uh, with Wagner, the the, the, the human, uh, human substance lies in an impassioned devotion to the folk, but it's still, it's an inner movement. Um, Nietzsche, the will to power. When I bring up Nietzsche, often I say, but he wasn't an anti-Semite, he didn't like anti-Semites. Nietzsche had nothing but contempt for Jews and Judaism. He had contempt for the anti-Semites too, because they go along with the crowd. Everybody's an anti-Semite. If you want to be, rise above, be an ubermensch, you can't fall into that. But still, you, you still it's through the inner will, being self-legislating, autonomy, self-legislation, resolve. Instead of what? You might ask, well, what else is there? Instead of determining my meaning, my value, my worth, my identity through a relationship rather than through an inner feeling, belief, passion, reason, will, whatever that inner might be. And of course, the, the Jews represent this relational thinking. Um, it's the relationship in the, in the commandment to love the neighbor as yourself, as the, the kamocha as yourself doesn't mean, I know how much you love yourself, that's how much I want you to love your neighbor, no. Kamocha, as Levinas explains, means that is who you are. Whoever you are lies in that loving relationship in treating your neighbor in a loving manner. It's not about, and the vahavta, uh, you shall love, it's not about feeling a certain way, it's about acting a certain way. Be loving, la re'echa, be loving toward your neighbor. Okay. Uh, of course, the root for the, of the word love, ahava, hav, is to give, it's a giving. Treat your neighbor in a giving manner. Uh, it's not so, it, it's that offering to, the, the, to another in the midst of a relation that constitutes who I am. Not my inner will, resolve, autonomy, self legislation none of that. So you see how Jewish thinking might be a threat to this modern thinking. And this is one of the most chilling sculptures I've ever seen. Modern man. Um, it, it, it can only have a bad outcome, seems to me. I can't be my own ground of my own meaning any more than I can pick myself up by my own hair. The most famous of the German propaganda films, Nazi propaganda films, Triumph of the Will. Not Triumph of the Good, the Truth, the Spirit, It's the will, because the will is what determines everything else. In Nazi Germany, there is no concept of an unjust law. You don't have the, the, uh, the, the categories of law that you find, I was just talking to Dr. Pignon about Thomas Aquinas uh, and his treatise on law. 
There's no higher law. What is lawful is what you will to be lawful. Everything done to the Jews under Nazi rule was legal. In fact, if you watch, uh, the, uh, one of, for example, the film on, called Conspiracy, based on the, the notes taken at the Von Zay Conference, January 20th, 1942, where the heads of various German uh, division, government divisions gathered to discuss how to go about exterminating the Jewish people. You can see the notes taken by Adolf Eichmann online. <clears throat> and you'll see a couple of times Heydrich, who convened the meeting, insisted that everything must be done in a legal manner. Okay. Notice also how we understand law, just like how we understand medicine, is inextricably tied to how we understand sanctity of human being. Um, Eight of the 13 heads of German government divisions invited had doctorate degrees. This, the extermination of the Jews is something conceived by the intelligentsia. Maybe, and, and, and goes all the way down the line as far as implementing. Uh, so we have uh, Walter Schulze at the, the Nazi University Lecturers Meeting, 1939, declaring, um, this, what the great German thinkers of German idealism dreamed of and what was ultimately the kernel of their longing for liberty finally comes to life. Finally comes to life. Um, one of the most infamous thinkers of this period, Martin Heidegger, unrepentant, card-carrying Nazi, who um, in his, it was called the Rector's the, the his speech is Rector of Freiburg University. Uh, the speech is called the, the Self-Assertion the self of the German University. Uh, he, he glorified, he extolled the magnificence, magnificence and greatness of National Socialism. Uh, in, in the student newspaper, he published an article in November 1933 in which he says the Fuhrer himself and he alone is the, is the present future and German reality and its law. Heidegger, not stupid. Heidegger's not stupid. Um, one of his students, famous student, Karl Lovett, Jewish guy, had to get out of Dodge, right, in the 30s. 19, he stopped to see Heidegger in 1936 as he was leaving the country. And he asked Heidegger, isn't, th isn't there, after all, a connection between the, the philosophy you espouse and the party you embrace here? National Socialist Party? Heidegger, yes. Heidegger himself thought there was a, that National Socialism was the historical realization of his thinking. Now, again, all of this, how we understand human being, how we understand law, philosophy, medicine, Education, education. We're here in the halls of a great university, the Texas Christian <laughs> University. Um, how do we understand the ground of the dearness of the human being? The, no uh, the Nazis have their view that the, a human being has value because he or she happens to be born an Aryan, as they understand that term. And secondly, to the extent that you can bring to bear a will to power, you take on greater depth and meaning. You can see how this would be antithetical to Jewish teaching. I mean, uh, polar opposites. Um, you can see how this, this polar opposition gets set up, again, uh, with, with the mythologizing of the Jew. And the Aryan, this is, the Aryans don't look like this. They're both, these are both mythologized figures. Um, what is the Jewish teaching found in the Torah? Teaching concerning, you know, covenantal relation to the Creator. What gives a human being value? And what is my relation to my fellow human being? An Aryan has no more connection to a non-Aryan than you have to an insect. 
Um, it's like uh, Amon Gert says, this, the scene in Schindler's List, he says to Helen, it's too bad you're not a human being. So there may have been possibilities for us, right? Uh, what, the teaching of Torah is that, that each of us is, as you know, created in the image and likeness of the Holy One. Therefore, there is, there is the presence of something infinitely precious within each human being. Nothing that meets the eye. Nothing that can be observed, or weighed, measured, or counted. The Talmud says, blessing does not fall on what can be weighed, measured, or counted. It, it, it's... It's, it's not based on intelligence, age, whether you're fat, thin, pretty, ugly, healthy, unhealthy. That's not what determines your value uh, as, one, as a child of God. Secondly, each of us comes from a single human being. Therefore, each of us is a ben adam, the Hebrew word for human being, ben adam, child of Adam. The rabbis ask, why, why does God begin with one? and not with two. I mean, it takes two. He got around to creating two, but he begins with one, say the sages, so that no one can say to another, my side of the family is better than your side. There's only one side, and we are a family. With all of the demands that come with being in a family, and this is, this is you can also see, is antithetical to Nazi teaching. And this, you know, the account of the creation. This is God reaching out to Adam, interestingly. Which one's God? God's the one who's in search of the human being. Um, so, enter this concept of Ras and Zela. Um, Alfred Rosenberg, Nazi ideologue, explains that uh, from the standpoint of Ras and Zela, he says that uh, blood and character, race and soul are, men, are different designations for, designations for the same thing. Blood, character, race, soul. It's all the same. Race, Ras and Zela is race, soul. And um, what threatens the Jewish or, or the German Geist, the mind or spirit, as Rosenberg says, is not Jewish blood. It's Judaism, because the ism is in the blood. This is why the extermination of the Jews has to be total. Every Jew is Judaism positive. Every Jew is a carrier. Religious or not religious, they, they, the, the extermination project has to be total. Um, and indeed, in, in Mein Kampf, those of you who have, who have been able to stomach it and have read it uh, may recall that Hitler says that, that the complete annihilation of a teaching and tradition can take place only through a process of extermination. And the extermination has to be complete. It has to be complete. And because what you're after is, is, some, is, is the invisible. The Jew is invisible, as invisible as Satan. Uh, this is, you know, Nazi propaganda piece. The, the invisible wire puller is how Hitler refers to the Jew in Mein Kampf. Like the, like the bacterium under the microscope. You can't see it, but it's there. It's gonna and it's going to kill you. It's going to contaminate you. Um, Europe had to be cleansed of the Jews, had to be made Juden rein. At the Banzai conference, when they, they were figuring out, they figured they'd have to kill about 11 million Jews, was their estimate. And they had areas uh, that were designated already Juden rein, purified, cleansed of the Jews. Um, At, at the heart of Judaism, of course, we, we have things like the commandments, the mitzvot, the Ten Commandments. And Hitler, in an interview in 1922, Hitler told a journalist that, he says, once I'm in power, my first and foremost task will be the annihilation of the Jews. 1922. 
Um, the intention was always there. He was, he, what he wasn't sure of was whether it could be done. People, you know, you know the argument, did the Nazis really mean to kill all those Jews? It's an absurd question. But uh, if, if so, when did it become official policy? The, I, my answer is when they thought they could do it. It's not, an, it's not an easy job. He also told that his friend that once he's in power, he will destroy the tyrannical God of the Jews and his life-denying Ten Commandments. Life-denying Ten Commandments. And we, so so you, you, to, to destroy the God of Abraham is to obliterate the prohibition against murder. The Nazis never murdered any, any Jews. They processed units. They, they rendered territories, pure, cleansed of the Jews. They resettled the Jews. They turned Jews over to special handling. They never talked about killing Jews. And we also have a, a tradition in Judaism that says, uh, don't read the commandments one through 10, read them in, in Hebrew from right to left. Anochi Hashem, I am, I am God, means lo tirzach, do not murder. To kill God is to kill the prohibition. Um, the project set in motion June 22nd with the Einsatz, 1941, with the Einsatz group and the killing units, four, four of them following the army to the west. Incidentally, uh, I mean, like all units, the, the commanders were rotated in and out, but at one time or another, every commander of every killing unit had a doctorate degree. Okay. This is Bobby Yar. Bobby Yar's been in the news lately, if you're following what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, I don't, I won't talk about the Ukraine right now, although I could. The, um, the memorial in Tromsø, Norway. Has anybody been to Tromsø, Norway? Well north of the Arctic Circle. In the, it's the Arctic. There were 17 Jews who lived there and the Nazis sent some of their guys to go get them. That's not scapegoating. That's not bigotry. That's metaphysics. Okay, the Arctic. Um, that's how you kill God. As God is omnipresent, the extermination has to be omnipresent, has to be ubiquitous. How do you kill God? God is, he wants to destroy, Hitler wants to destroy the, the God of Abraham and his life denying Ten Commandments. So you have incidents like this. You, uh, this is a famous image of uh, Rabbi Moshe Hagerman, just seconds before he was murdered. You have diarists from the period, like uh, Herman Kruk, <clears throat> from the Vilna Ghetto. Um, in case you're wondering whether the, the Nazis know what they're doing, it's, in the upper echelons, they know exactly what they're doing. And the Gestapo, indeed, had a division called Judenforschung on a Juden, which means research into Jewish things without involving the Jews. So they studied Talmud, they studied the languages, they studied the history, they studied the holiday observances, they studied the prayers. And they used that learning to undertake a radical assault on the soul, on the teaching, on the tradition. So you have other diarists, like uh, Zeli Kalmanovich, <clears throat> you know, saying that a war is being waged against the Torah and God against the moral law and the creator of the universe. God, Torah, and Israel are the objects of extermination. How else do you, how do you kill God? You kill the entrance of holiness into this realm, which happens on holy days. A holy day is not a day off. Uh, it's not even a special day. It's a day for, for various religious traditions. It's a day when the eternal enters time. Uh, if you're a believer, a Christian believer, on Easter, you stand at the empty tomb. Not as if. On Passover, this night, we come out of Egypt. Tonight, this is us coming out of Egypt. So, uh, in the camp, the massive selections were held on holy days. 
Um, Sally Wiesel once said, we didn't have a calendar, but we knew when the holy days were because that's when the big selections took place. Rosh Hashanah, when God opens the book to determine who will live, who will die, Mengele would tell them, you think God's gonna decide this day, who will live, who will die? No, I am, I'm deciding. Yom Kippur, Emmanuel Ringelblum notes the practice of hanging Jews, torturing Jews. This is a scene from Yom Kippur in Poland under the Nazis. Um, transports to Treblinka began to Shabab, 1942. The, the big transports started pulling out of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, in the Warsaw Ghetto, this is a very powerful diary from the Warsaw Ghetto by Heim Kaplan, who records the day when prayer was forbidden as an act of sabotage. Prayer is sabotage. It's not just we're gonna kill you, but we forbid you to pray. You know, in the, in the Westerns, before you know, the bad guy shot somebody, say, say your prayers. There's to be no, of course they prayed, didn't mean that Jews didn't pray. But the whole, the point concerns, you know, this assault on God. Prayer in, in Jewish tradition, Baal Shem Tov. The prayer is the Shekhinah. The prayer is the presence of God. Um, God is uh, most proud, profoundly manifest in Jewish tradition in children. The, the, the Kabbalistic text, uh, one called Tikkunei Zohar says, that the Shekhinah the, is children, in other, or children are the face of the Shekhinah, the divine presence. All of creation is held up by the breath of little children, we're taught in the Talmud. Not by the powerful shoulders of Atlas, but by holiness. Um, the, the Midrash says when the, children, when, the, when the Babylonians took away the priests and the Levites, the holy city was, remained holy. When they took the children, the holy city lost its holiness. The Nazis know these teachings. More than 85% of the Jewish children of Europe were slaughtered. Those of you who have been to Yad Vashem, perhaps have gone through the Children's Memorial, it's like walking through a tomb, uh, through darkness that, that is, has a million and a half points of light on the ceilings, the floors all around you. There's a rail, not because it's dark, but because you swoon as you hear the name, the age, and the hometown of one child after child after child. They've identified about a third by name. It takes three years to read the list. Every five, six, seven seconds, you hear a name. Um, Yechiel Dinor, who testified at the Eichmann trial, wrote that there, here there, in the ghettos, there are no children. There are only big Jews and little Jews. Uh, George Salton, whose daughter, Anna, is, is with us today, wrote in his memoir, the 23rd Psalm, that he, he went six years without seeing a Jewish child. The Nazis rendered entire areas void of children. They were taken first. They were put on transports first. Um, you have the children of Terezin, Theresienstadt. Here, it was one camp where there were children. But from Theresienstadt, children were sent to Auschwitz on transports that consisted entirely of children. Uh, Sarah nomberg in her memoir, she was in the women's camp. The women's camp is right across from where, where the Jews were unloaded in Birkenau. She says, suddenly the stillness was broken by the screaming of children. A scream repeated a thousand times in a single word, mama. A scream that increased in intensity every second enveloping the whole camp. Our lips parted without our being conscious of what we were doing and a scream of despair tore out of our throats and then everything was silent. Um, 
if the crime of the Jew is being alive, the most heinous of criminals is the one who brings the Jew into the world, the, the mother. The Katzet uh, Diener has a, a memoir, his one memoir, it's not, well, actually wrote something later on that's like a memoir. It's called Shiviti in English. It was from the, the, uh, the eighth Psalm. I, I have placed thee before me always, O Lord, Shiviti, Adoshem Kenegadi Tamid, La Negadi Tamid. It's a book in which he has, that has one thing that his novels don't have. And he once told me the novels are about Auschwitz. Shiviti is Auschwitz. So I'm, I read, I'm reading Shiviti. What is it? What is it? There's a scene of the murder of his mother in Shiviti that appears nowhere in the novels. Other stuff does. Okay. I found out after he died, I found out a, more about him after he died than when I knew him when he was alive. His mother actually died before the war. So he's, he's, seen, he's seeing in the murder of the mother, the gassing of the mother, the burning of the mother, he's seeing what Auschwitz is. The one who first utters your name with love, the one with whom you have your first human-to-human -human relationship. In Auschwitz, it's the relation that's under assault. The soul doesn't live in us, the soul lives between us. There's a very chilling line in Night, Elie Wiesel's memoir, where he's trying to find food for his father, and one of the prisoners takes him aside and says, look, here there are no fathers. There are no sons. There are no friends. There's no relation. There's no human-to-human -human relation. Primo Levi wrote that in Auschwitz, everyone is ferociously alone. That's how you kill the soul. That's how you kill God. Um, by killing the human being. You remember the scene at the center of night, the hanging of the child. Where is God? Where is God now? And Eliezer answers, here he is, he's hanging on these gallows. It's at the very center of the book. So I'm, I'm coming to, you know, winding down here. What is a human being? Um, what becomes of the human being in the anti-world? The, in, in Auschwitz, you have what Emil Fackenheim calls the Nazis' most original and defining creation, the Muslim. Uh, Primo Levi says of the Muslim, that the Muslim, Muslim manner, form the backbone of the camp. They are an anonymous mass, continually renewed and always identical of non-men who march and labor in silence, the divine spark dead within them, already too empty to really suffer. One hesitates to call them living, one hesitates to call their death, death. These are not just individuals who have been the victims of starvation, exposure, exhaustion, brutality, dehumanization. They are Jews who've seen their families murdered before their eyes, who've seen their children taken from them, who have been forbidden to pray, who have who've had their, their mezuzahs torn off their doors, who have had every level of assault on them until the soul is dead, the divine spark dead within them. The backbone of the camp, the defining feature of the camp, they don't die. They're, the one hesitates to call their death, death. In the camp, in the, in the ghettos, in the concentration area universe, there is no natural death. There's no sitting Shiva, mourning, rites of mourning. There's no burial. Did anyone see Son of Saul, about the Zonda Commando guy who finds a dead child and is desperately trying to find a way to bury him? He's, this is the, 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 the group that worked in the crematoria and gas chamber area. He's trying to save a death. He's not trying to save a life. He can't save a life. Um, this is what makes the Holocaust, this, this unique feature of the Holocaust is something that makes it a matter that concerns all of humanity. The unique horror of the Holocaust is that it was an assault on the very principle 
that makes other horrors horrible and not just matters of academic curiosity. It's an assault on what binds each soul to the other, each child of Adam to the other, each child of God to the other. Um, there's one more unique feature of this event that binds each of us to the other. In 1986, April 26, 1986, there was an accident in Chernobyl. Some of you are old enough to remember. Uh, one day, one chimney, one cloud goes, uh, radioactive material goes into the atmosphere. Two, two weeks later, radiation levels in Montana were elevated. The ashes, the radioactive material is cast to the wind. In the time of the Holocaust, we're talking about not one chimney one day, we're talking about a, th a dozen chimneys that operated for a thousand days casting the body of Israel to the winds. Steady rain of ash over Beer Canal, Auschwitz, the area. Steady rain of ash. If, when you go to Beer Canal, you're walking on three to four feet of Jewish remains on the ground. The winds carry those ashes over the earth. The ashes are in the earth from which we harvest our bread. They're in the bread that we put in our mouth. and they nag. Um, Arnold Lustig says it's better than I do. He's a Holocaust survivor in his novel, A Prayer for Katarina uh, Horovitsova. He says these ashes would be indestructible and immutable. They would not burn up into nothingness because they themselves were remnants of fire. No one living would ever be able to escape them. These ashes will be contained in the breath and expression of every one of us, and the next time anybody asks, what the air he breathes is made of, he will have to think about these ashes. They will be contained in books which haven't been written and will be found in the, re the remotest regions of the earth where no human foot has ever trod. No one will be able to get rid of them for they will be the fond, nagging ashes of the dead who died in innocence. And what do they ask? What do they say? How do they nag? They, they, they nag by putting to us the first question put to the first human, as I commented this morning, where are you? And even more profoundly, the questions put to the firstborn of the first human, put to Cain, where's your brother? And what have you done? Engaging this topic the point in engaging this topic, as I try to counsel my students, is not to slide into some dark abyss of despair, which is easy to do. The point is to take on a deeper capacity, a deeper understanding of, of what is at stake in saying to my fellow human being, here I am for you. Saying it not just with my lips, but with my hands, by being able to say, answer, what have you done? Thanks. Thank you. Do we have some time for Q&A? Uh, yeah, we do. I do. If you have any questions or comments, there are microphones throughout the, the area here that you can use uh, for those questions. Too much. No questions? <laughs> yeah, Ariel, please. <clears throat> Well, the, it's, it's, it's the, the Jewish faith, the Jewish teaching is a teaching not just about Jews, but about humanity. 
It's a teaching through which all the nations are blessed. Um, it's a teaching at once particular and, and universal. The Jews, what does being chosen mean exactly? Um, chosenness here is not being, uh, you know, among the elite or the elect. Chosenness is being assigned. And we are assigned to say to humanity, every human being is assigned. Every, every soul that enters this realm is indispensable to all of creation. Every soul comes on a mission and with a task to perform, a responsibility to meet. So that's you know, the light that we shine unto the nations, that teaching. So it, it's, it's a teaching that concerns not just the Jews, it concerns the Jews, of course, but it concerns uh, you know, a testimony that we bring to humanity. It includes the Noahide covenant, right? The covenant with the nations. Uh, so, what, what, so the Jews are tied to the nations. The people apart, paradoxically, are inextric inextricably bond to the nations. Um, I'm sure you've probably been in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem during Sukkot. Hundreds of Christians come to the city to celebrate the parade down King George Street. It's really something to see. Uh, from countries all over the world. Um, and we're taught that in the time of the Messiah, the nations will come to celebrate Sukkot, Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it, it's humanity, we're all B'nai Adam, right? We're all children of Adam. We're all bound to each to the other, spiritually, physically, metaphysically, uh, and ethically, uh, ethically. You know, Levinas says anti-Semitism is hatred of the other man. Anti-Semitism is not a form of racism. Racism is a form of anti-Semitism. I mentioned that the, Nazi, the Nazis were not uh, anti-Semites because they were racist. They were racist because they were anti-Semites. What does it mean? It means they had to establish an anti-Semitic, anti-Judaic premise namely separation of the race, uh, legitimized by power, will to power. They had to establish that premise in order to arrive at a racist outlook. The anti-Judaic premise precedes the race theory, the race ideology. Yeah, Anna. First, let me say what an honor it is to hear you. I've heard you speak so many times, and um, it's really an honor to hear you speak, and just wonderful. I learned a lot, and very moving, very inspiring. So my question is, as we know, Deborah Lipstadt was confirmed last night as a U.S. envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, and I was her guest at the confirmation hearing, uh, which was an honor, and in a conversation we had, and I said, well, I thought after Schindler's List, uh, you know, it would, it would be fixed, or after the U.S. Holocaust Museum, it would be fixed. And her reply to me was, well, if the Holocaust itself was not enough to end anti-Semitism, then what is? And that's my question to you, because you have so well explained and taught about the rise of anti-Semitism. So, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, thank you for that question, an excellent question. Um, Anti-Semitism is, <clears throat> is in the soul of any child of Adam. It's not about we versus they, it's about me. It's in me. Uh, if I want to get rid of anti-Semitism, I have to start with me. The, the anti-Semitism stems from the original temptation, the first temptation, you will be like God. The anti-Semite would usurp the throne of divine judgment to determine who is saved, who is damned, who is pure, who is impure, uh, who is part of the fold, who is not. Uh, so it's, it's anti, the anti-Semite invariably gets rid of God one way or the other. To be like God, not the God who is uh, 
patient, loving, slow to anger, quick to forgive, you know, the 13 attributes. It's not that God. It's the God who gets his way, the God who is all-powerful, the God who controls everything. Um, and as long as there is a Jew in the room, there's somebody telling me, you're not God. You're not God. But each of us wants to be God. The ego wants to be like God. Um, so I, for the, because it's in the soul, I don't think it's ever going to go away, frankly. At least not till the Messiah comes. And uh, the word of the Holy One is inscribed in every heart somehow. Um, it, it's, so it, it's not reducible to scapegoating or even racism or bigotry, although these, these things are often in the mix. They're in the mix. I'm just saying it's not reducible to that. There's a deeper reason. Um, more education, more opposition, more, uh, more vocal, more aggressive, uh, speaking up, speaking out, doing something. Hell, it, it all helps. Um, but it won't go away. It's not, we're, we're not asked to complete the task, we're, but we're not free to refrain from it. Right. So, yeah, the, it doesn't mean you should throw up your hands. I'm not saying, Hasva Khalil, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's not going to go away, as I see it. Other questions? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how to put this together, so I'm going to try to think on the fly. I think I understood you to say that a uh, deep connection between um, anti Semitism and the killing of God. Would you then equate atheists with being inherently anti Semitic, and where would that be? No, um, that's a good question. Um, are atheists inherently anti-Semitic? Um, not necessarily. Uh, the, you know, the, the Talmud says it's better for your, your deeds to exceed your wisdom than your wisdom to exceed your deeds. Um, and I, and I, I know many, many professed atheists who, in many cases, turn out to be, not that they don't believe in God, but they're angry with God. Or they're like Ivan Karamazov. Uh, they can't accept this, create. if this is from God, I don't accept it. Uh, so Ivan says to Alyosha, the suffering of a single child is not worth the price of redemption. That I get. When atheism becomes part of an ideology, like dialectical materialism, as it played out in the Soviet Union, you know, with Stalin and others, yes, it has to go anti-Semitic. It has to go anti-Semitic. Um, but some, I mean, there are people, atheists are, are as complicated as believers. There, there are atheists who have a profound love for their, for their neighbor, their fellow human being. Who will do anything for you? Um, who sometimes, in spite of themselves, they're like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, right? I, I stick my neck out for nobody, he says, right? And yet, that's what he ends up doing. So um, athe I, I don't want to make sweeping generalizations about atheists, but I, I know in some cases, like the, the Soviet case, Atheism is the official state religion, so to say. Not coincidentally, it's very anti-Semitic. Has to be. Very anti-Christian, for that matter. Right. Excellent question. I mean, you show that this is not always so simple. You know. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, 
My name is Dr. Suki John. It's weird to have my face up there. I don't know how to make it wait, but um, I'm grateful to Dr. Patterson for this um, really illuminating talk about anti-Semitism, um, which we all know about, but really don't understand. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I really appreciate that. I took a lot of notes. I was really... I am a professor of dance here at TCU, and I am the director and founder of the Schma Project, which is an artistic and educational initiative to teach about the Holocaust and human rights. We are um, supported by the Jewish Federation of Tarrant County in Fort Worth, and by TCU and by the Texas Jewish Arts Association and by individual donors. It's not a TCU project, but it is a project that TCU um, has embraced um, in its um, TCU Invest in Scholarship and also through my own department, the dance department, uh, who's giving us rehearsal space. This is a dance film, educational workshop, educational materials program, uh, meaning that we are creating all of the above. And um, the first two minute promotional video, um, actually one of our dance students helped me to edit it, and it explains the project. I'm gonna play it for you because it is very concise and it also has some dance imagery in it, so you get a feeling for what we're trying to do. I will say that we go into rehearsals in May and we start filming um, in June. Alex and Elite Productions are gonna be part of this process, which is great, and um, I am happy to answer questions afterwards, but I don't wanna to take too much time. That's the cantor of Budapest singing the Shema. When I first made um, the ballet in the former Yugoslavia, I traveled to Budapest, visited my cousin who lived there, and we went to the Budapest synagogue, and I was able to get that recording. So um, I have uh, flyers. I'm here. We are really interested in community support. Uh, we're interested in uh, just getting the word out and having um, allies and um, friends, other educators in the community join the project. So thank you, and thank you, Dr. Patterson. Thank you.